All right, I did grade your uh, tests. We'll go over those in a bit. Dean's taking it right now. Um, I also graded your homeworks, and uh, I'm going to give you back your test page, and it'll have your homework grade on it and your test grade on it, okay, just so you're aware of that. <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is go over Chapter 7, just so you know. The, the programs that I graded from you, the ones that, that uh, I graded, virtually all of you, if not all of you, gave me programs 1, 2A, 2B, and 3. 3 was the first one we did that had object-oriented stuff in it. I didn't look at those. Okay? The plan is today we're going to go over Chapter 7, and after we go done, get done with Chapter 7 uh, in here, we're going to look at a payroll program, we're going to go back and do that array fund program that we've done before. We're going to do that in Java. And then we'll see where we are time-wise. All right. Then tomorrow, we will do a similar type of thing, but with Chapter 8. Okay. And that will make that'll bring us till Wednesday. And <clears throat> we'll see exactly where we are then. I don't really want to go any further than that. I don't plan on giving you a test this week. All right, but what I'd like to do, if possible, is to get through Chapter 9 this week. I'm not going to test you on 9. We'll do a program just so you've got some experience and exposure to it. All right, but there won't be any, <clears throat> there won't be any um, test. Next Monday, the 22nd, I'm planning on giving you a test, and anything that we've gone over thus far in the first eight chapters then will be fair game. Does that make sense? It'll be won't be set up that much differently from the test that you took last time. Won't be the same problem, of course, but there'll probably just be one problem. Then next week, we're going to spend virtually all of our time on chapters 10 <clears throat> and 11. Chapter 10 is on inheritance, and chapter 11 is on exception handling. That's the most important stuff that we have to do as far as the Java stuff goes. If we get done with all that, great. Then we'll go into Chapter 12, and I'll show you how to write a GUI Java program. All right, and that's fine. But when you do, you, so you will have a test a week from Monday, and you'll probably have one maybe even the next Monday that'll be on like 10 and 11. I'm not going to test you on any, anything from 12 on in the book. We might do a, a program or two for mo, you know, most chapters. <clears throat> but again, the goal is by as early in February as possible to be out of regular Java and be into the Android stuff. All right? And again, what does that mean? Well, in an ideal world, we would be through that Android book, what I'm planning on covering on it, that Android Java stuff, by no later than the break. All right, and then after the break, we would do some Kotlin stuff for a few weeks. Then you're going to get your project where you have to go out and create your own app. You should be thinking about that right now, even if you think, well, I don't know anything about writing apps. No, but you could at least start thinking about something you might have an interest in. <clears throat> and if you really get stuck... And you're like, you know, I'd like to do something, but I don't really have a clue. You know, I do have a teacher, a, an instructor that I used to work with at Blackhawk who's looking for somebody to have an app made for him. All right? And he keep, keeps getting on me. Will you do it? Will you do it? Yeah, when I find time. The problem is finding time. All right? But if you're interested or possibly interested in that, send me an email, and I'll send you a thing back from him explaining what he's looking for. All right? <clears throat> Okay, so again, on Chapter 7, Arrays and the Array List class. What you're going to find is virtually everything we ever learned about arrays, virtually everything we ever learned about arrays for uh, C Sharp is 100% the same in Java. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to explain it. Now, Java also has something that are, that's called an Array List. Now, with arrays, and we've, I've given you this term before, but I just want to make sure, again, for consistency's sake, that you hear it. Arrays in Java are known as early binded. 
And what that means is at compile time, the system needs to know exactly how much memory to put aside. That's why you cannot change the size of an array when the program's running. You can't do that. Now, when you work with array lists, they're late binded, which means that they're all done at runtime. That's why an array list, you can change the size of an array list as the program's running. So you can add to it, remove from it on an as needed basis. All right. Basically, you're kind of hosed with an array. You know, if you think, well, I might need 50, I might need 500. Then what a lot of people do is they make it 500. And they may have, they may have 450 they don't use. All right. So I just gave you a lot of that stuff. Again, we'll look at the useful array algorithms and operations. That's that uh, we'll go over again that array fund program. All right. We'll write that a little bit later on today. <clears throat> sequential search algorithm, I think we've talked about that before. With a sequential search algorithm, you start from the beginning and you search all the way through the list. The list doesn't have to be in any kind of order. In the best case, you find it right away, the first element. In the worst case, it's not there. That's why typically when you use a sequential search, it's one of the worst just because of the fact that typically by default, you search through on, on average half the list until you find the item all right parallel arrays i believe you all know what parallel arrays are all right basically it's two arrays that are the same size so you can you can go iterate or work your way through both arrays in the same loop using the same loop control variable two-dimensional arrays just like most other languages java definitely supports two-dimensional arrays and again when people tell me I don't know what a two-dimensional array is, there's a two-dimensional array right there. But as opposed to the way they do it in a language like Excel where you've got letters along the top for your column names and rows along the side for your row, or, or numbers along the side for your row name, in Java they're both numbers. And your magical spot is not A1 right there. So that's not A1 in an array. That's 0, 0. All right. You can have arrays of any dimension. Typically, you don't find most people having an array of more than three dimensions just because it's very hard for most people to, to create something that they can't, what is we saying in their mind's eye, that they can't fathom it. All right. The selection sort in the binary search, the binary search, in that case, the stuff has to be in sorted order already. It is a halving search, H-A-L-V-I-N-G, where you keep cutting your list in half. All right. Selection sort is not that different from the bubble sort. The idea is you go through a list very many times, and on every iteration through the list, you either move the biggest number to the end or the smallest number to the beginning. All right. Command line arguments, I won't have very much to say about. They really don't spend much time in this book on the array list class, just so you know. There's very little on it. All right. Okay. Primitive variables. Okay. Java has eight primitive variables. What are they again? Double, the code, 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 the also known as elementary data types or simple data types because they can only hold one value at a time. All right.
right? That's just the way that they're set up. When you have an array, you know this already. I've shown you examples like this. You know, I always give the example, you know, in the apartment that I live in, there are eight units in the, in the one I'm in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right? And, you know, they are literally, they are numbers, I think, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. All right? But if somebody, you know, sends, sends something to that address, even if they don't have the apartment on there, it'll typically go to the right place, usually. But as you'd probably guess, living in an apartment, I get mail all the time for people who used to live in that place before I did. All right? And it's not always the same people. I've probably gotten for five different people with five different names on it. Now, when you are working, when you are working with an array, though, the first location is location 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right? That still says, though, the, the length of the array is 8. It's just, again, we go from 0 to 7. Okay? And what Java tries to do, just like other programming languages, and it, it does a good job of it because their arrays are early binded, it tries to make sure that these memory locations are contiguous. And it, that may not sound like a big thing, but by making them contiguous one after another, where there's no pockets between there, you get a lot faster response time, all right, when stuff is put together. So again, if I had a, an array and these were, were, let's just say, not your tests, but let's say they were tests, 71, 83, 94, 100, 56, 21, 71, and 8, all right? So I would say something like int bracket bracket equals new int. Now, if I wanted to, all right, if I wanted to, I could, if I wanted to initialize it with these values, I could say new int, and I could say curly brace, 71, 83. I could do that, all right? If I didn't know what those values were ahead of time, I'd probably do something like this. Okay? But that's virtually the same way that it's done in C Sharp. All right? Just like C Sharp, an array can only hold one type of data at a time. The good news is that one type of data can be an object. And that's what you're going to see a little bit later today. All right? Pretty much what we just looked at here, so I'm not going to run through it again. Arrays are one of the things that are in Java. Arrays, array lists, uh, hash maps, let's see, objects, etc. Arrays are passed by reference. So if I pass an array, if I pass this array right here, if I pass this array to a routine, in essence, what I'm doing, let's suppose, <clears throat> it, in fact, it doesn't even matter. If, I, if this array is called, what do we call it? Int bracket bracket, I think we ought to do it really long. Bracket bracket, let's just say we call this test. All right, or test, that's fine. If I go and pass test as a parameter, what it actually does is it passes the address of test sub zero. So it passes the address of where that one lives. Okay, and the reason for that actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Sometimes arrays have millions or maybe even billions of elements. And if you were passing all those values around all the time, that would be, that could be a cluster. So by passing the address to the first element, it works a hell of a lot faster. And it's not just Java that does that. Virtually every type of programming language that allows arrays does it like that. All right. Quite often when you set up an array, you, would, you will set up a, a um, constant ahead of time so you know the size of the array. You don't have to do that, but you should. All right. I don't know what I'm going to do for the next, for the next uh, test that you take, but, you know, some of you did a really good job of, like, creating your constants. Some of you basically had no constants in there. That's a waste. All right, you know, and I was dinging the people in the, the first year people and talking about that with them today. They had to do a very simple program, and it might have even been the one that you did. I don't remember where you had to buy, you bought some t-shirts, 
okay? And they had to write it both as a, as a GUI app and as a non-GUI app. But every T-shirt cost $13 or $14.99. And, and your whole bill had a tax rate of 8%. Virtually everyone in that class made a constant for the tax rate of 8%. Very good. Almost no one made, it, made a, a uh, constant for the price per shirt, which was $14.99. Not very good. If you've got stuff that you know in a program isn't going to change by using constants, you're making your program more self-documenting. And this is, you know, again, you might think I'm slamming you. I'm not. But collectively in here, okay, if, if, if you were going to get hired or not get hired based on the comments that you put into your programs, most of you wouldn't get hired. I'm just telling you because that's the way it is. The majority of you in here, really basically all of you, know how to program. Many of you know how to program exceptionally well. But sometimes the only times you put in documentation is when you're forced to put in documentation. All right. <clears throat> array elements. If you pass an individual array element, not a whole array, but if I just pass an element into a, into a routine, it's just another variable. That's all that it is. Bounds checking, as it says, you know, you will get one of the most popular exceptions to get in Java is this one right here. Array index out of bounds exception. Now, I shouldn't even have to tell you what that exception is. If I say that my array, for instance, the array that you see up on the, on the board here, it has eight elements. If I tried to access test sub eight and there isn't one, I'd get one of those. Okay. It's very easy to get off by one errors. What's the error right there? You should be able to see, you can see what they've got in red. That should be less than 100. All right. In fact, it shouldn't even be that. It should be for i equals 0, i less than 100. All right. So there's actually this should be a 0, and this should just be a less than sign. All right. Array initialization. This is one way you can initialize. If you look up on the screen there, if you do that, the recommendation is always don't, don't, don't put a number in here. Don't do that. You're making the compiler do more work because rather than the, comp the compiler has to count it anyway. But it can figure out when you've done this, if there's 10, 10 days in here or whatever, boom, it just does it. But otherwise, you make it do more work. Plus, you could screw it up. What do we have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Is it the ones? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah. Okay. So we could have put a 12 in there. But what if you put 13? What if you put 10? And again, you, well, I wouldn't do that. Everybody does it. All right. It's funny because I'll mention something. You, you guys aren't so much like that, but you were about a year ago. When I'd say, yep, you know, and if you don't know what you're doing, you could do this. And then, you know, at least one of the first-year students, no matter what I say, they hang their heads. I know he's talking about me. No, we all do it. Everybody makes mistakes like that occasionally. All right? So doing that is the same thing as doing it this way. Okay, where you'd say day sub 0 equals 31, day sub 1 equals 28, etc. All right? And in a little bit, when, when uh, Mr. El Hassan finishes with his test, but it'll be later on this afternoon. I get that. When I give you years back, you know, you might have done very well on the test, and you might not have written it anything like I did. That's totally fine. All right? Because I didn't spend the time that most of you spent on it. I thought, okay, what do I want to do? Boom, boom, boom. I just did it. You know, so, well, how long did it take you? I don't know. I don't time myself when I take tests. Now, you can do it like this. This is the way everybody defines their arrays. That's the way I'll expect you to do it. You can do it like this. That's a holdover, actually, from the C programming language. C is the only one I know that you must do it like that in C. 
And since so many um, Java programmers learn C as their first language, that's why they still, they still allow that. All right. Multiple arrays can be declared on the same line. Now, don't do this. That's just stupid. I mean, I have a hard time realizing that all of those are arrays. So I'd expect you to put those on three different lines. Yeah, it's a little more typing. All right. Okay. Processing data in arrays, yeah, same as any other variable. Pre and post work the same, etc. All right. Uh, array elements, yeah. You can do anything if you're working with an array element that you can do with a regular variable. All right. Notice on this slide right here, length is a constant. We have worked with other languages where length is a method. So you have to say length paren paren, not in this language. And since, since it is a constant, what does that mean? It can never, the, the, you know, the name of an array dot length can never appear on the left-hand side of an equal sign. That should make sense to you. All right. Okay, we may or may not have talked about this already. There is an enhanced for loop that you can use with arrays. So it, rather than say, saying for, so, you know, LCV equals zero, LCV less, et cetera. What you do here, I think the, yeah, there's an example, and there's a mistake in there that should be a capital F. I guess I don't have it set up so I can change that. But notice what we have here. We've got an array with three elements in it. There could have been 53 elements in it. It doesn't matter. You say for that int val, you're creating that variable right there. Does that make sense? That's local right there. And it says val in numbers, so in the array. If you use this, it's called an enhanced for loop. You cannot change the values of anything that's in the array. If you plan on changing the values, maybe you want to add one to each value, then you got to use a regular for loop. But the enhanced for loop is typically used just like this if you want to be able to print everything out. Plus, you, you can't use the enhanced for loop and skip over some parts of the array. It's enhanced for loop, but it, you have to go through the entire array. <clears throat> now, it may not sound like a big thing. I'm just going to grab this code out of here. Or try to. Let's pretend for a second. Okay, so we've got this code right here. I'll blow it up so we can all see it. All right. Now, I'm telling you, and you all know this, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this code the way it's written. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing. Okay? But if I did this, if, if I did this, if I said int size equals, and I put this right there, Can you think of why it might be advantageous to do that as opposed to what we had before? Let's say that the size, let's just assume for a second the size is one million, okay? You know how fast a computer can go to a million. It can count to a million faster than you and I can count to 10. But that isn't even the point. The point is, if there's a million in there, it, if we put in temperature.length, it has to figure that out a million times. If we do it like this, it only has to figure it out one time because now it knows what that value is. This, for lack of better words, while the program is running, it's a constant while the program's running. All right, so that's like if there's a million things in there, that's like putting a million right there. You should always strive to do that. You know, it's the same kind of thing that we learned back in the AWD 1000 class. If you remember... We talked about the fact that you always 
validate on the client side. And we talked about reasons that you always validate on the client side. And one of those reasons was you're not making the server do work that it really shouldn't have to do because the server typically has enough to do anyway. It's the same kind of thing right here. Why make the system do more work than it has to do? All right. So this is the kind of thing you should be shooting for. And, and I always forget, but it, and he's reminded me of it before, um, Mr. Fugner right there, that this line right here, there's nothing wrong with that in gray. But that will actually execute faster. They have done studies where they have hooked the system clock up and to say to do a pre-increment as opposed to a post-increment, the pre-increment will run faster. All right? Now, I wouldn't take off if you if you did it, if you put temperature.length here and you put it I++ here. But the point is, you never know if, if you go and, and, you know, you go to, to uh, try to get a job for a company. It's not at all inconceivable that either they will put you up in front of a whiteboard, give you a problem and ask you how you code it, or literally give you a coding test. And if they give you a coding test and you put temperatures.length here, you're going to look like somebody who, who's making the computer do more work than it has to do. All right? And that might be the way that they remember you. It's probably not going to be what you want. An array reference can be assigned to another array of the same type. All right? They've got here int numbers equal new int 10. Then they've got numbers equal new int 5. Well, what that does then is it doesn't grab just five of those first 10 locations. It literally gives you a new place in memory for those five locations, and then it marks those 10 as not being used anymore. So they can be what are, what's called garbage collected. But again, it's all working with addresses as we talked about before. All right, you cannot copy one array to another. If you look up on the screen, don't do that. That does not make a copy. What that does, if you do this, is now array two and array one are the same thing. They're both pointing to the same memory location. If you've got an array and you want to copy the, an array from one location to another, you've got to put it into a loop, a for loop, typically is what you're going to use, all right, and, and copy it over a, an element at a time. There is an example. All right. We already mentioned when you pass a single element to an array, it's like passing anything else. When you pass an entire array, you're passing it by reference. So as it says, when you're calling numbers here, you're passing it the address when you do this. Also, note, note this. In the actual method, not only do you have to say the type, but you have to say bracket, bracket. If it's a two-dimensional array, bracket, 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 etc. All right. You can't use the equal sign, as it says, to compare arrays. We already talked about that. Instead, you've got to compare it element by element. All right. When we go into, in just a couple minutes, when we look at the array fun example, all right, we will do the highest value, we will do the lowest value, we will do the sum, and we will do the average. So you'll see all those. One thing that you can do in, in Java, you can do the same thing in C-sharp. In C-sharp, they call these ragged edge arrays. Java calls them partially filled arrays, okay? And they actually, it works with jagged arrays, too. I guess we're going to see that probably next. But with a partially filled array, it says... Typically, if the amount of data that the array must hold is unknown, the size will be the largest thing that's expected. And you can use a variable and only use the amount that you need. All right? You're still going to be wasting it. So if, if I've got three classes, one with 500 people, one with 50, and one with 10, if I want one array to be able to handle all three classes, I've got to make it 500. That means I'm wasting 450 locations in one, on one hand and 490 on the other. Arrays will work fine with files. You can grab from a file and write to an array. You can grab from an array and write to a file. 
you can return all right an entire array notice in two when you return it it's the type bracket bracket to show that it's an array that you're returning you can have arrays of strings none of this stuff should seem new to you we've looked at stuff like this before in other classes It says here calling string methods on array elements. Some of this stuff we've already looked at. We've done the two uppercase. We've done the char at. All right. There is a compare to, but there's also, I believe that there's a compare to ignore case that won't even check on the, on the caseness of the two of them. There's a lot of ways that you can work with this stuff. We already talked about length. As it says, it is a final, meaning it's constant. And it is a, technically it's referred to as a property because it's not a method. This is what we're going to get into in just a minute. Now in the example that we do, okay, I did it a little bit different. You're going to see it. I've actually sent you an email that you're going to have to use um, for part of the array later. But let, we'll talk about it at that time, okay? As it says, because strings are objects, we know that arrays can contain objects. So this would be what? An array of bank account objects. What would be inside of there? Whatever is inside of the bank account. All right. We can make arrays of objects. We can make objects that some of their members are arrays. So the sequential search we looked at, you know, again, I've given this example before. The worst case is Ethan wants to call me up. All right, and he, he says, I know his name is in the Lake St. Louis phone book. All right, so he goes and looks through the entire book. Well, now he's got, he's got some really goofy book that's not in alphabetic order. So in the worst case, if it's 500 pages, he's got to go through all 500 pages, and in the worst case, I'm not in it. All right, that's the problem you get with a sequential search algorithm. You must sequentially go all the way through it. Also... If I wanted to find in here, let's say I wanted to use a sequential search algorithm and I wanted to find 71, it would stop when it got here. It would not find this one. By default, it's a sequential search. You can tell it to keep going, but you, by default, the way that sequential search algorithms are, they, they run, all right, as it says, it stops when the value is found. There's a two-dimensional array, as I mentioned to you earlier. Okay, rows and columns, rows go down, you know, I should say across. Columns go up and down, so rows are horizontal, columns are vertical. You always do arrays in row, column, order. And it doesn't matter what language you're talking about. All right? So there's a two-dimensional array. You already know, I, I think everybody knows this. Everybody know why the, Why are there 12 elements in that array? Three times four. No matter how many dimensions you have, if you've got numbers, you can multiply one dimension by another, by another, etc., and find out how many elements you're going to have. You must put it in there like this, bracket, 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 if it's two-dimensional. As it says... Each element has two subscripts, one for the row and one for the column. There's an example. So typically, if you know what you're doing, an array with two dimensions is going to have two different for loops. If you're doing initialization like that, if it's got three dimensions, three for loops, okay, etc. And there is no limit to the number of dimensions an array can have. I guess the only limit would be if you had something that maybe was, I don't know, you know, a, a million dimensions, you might run out of, you might literally run out of memory. I guess that would be possible. I don't know. I saw a thing over the weekend for, um, it was on one of the home shopping or QVC or one of those channels. And they had a new iPad on there, and it has 128 gig of memory, of memory, not of disk space, of memory. 
And with 128 gig, it's going to be a while before you run out of memory. All right, initializing a two-dimensional array like this, notice that you, you have to put inside of the curly braces, you have to put curly braces. Most people do it like this. Instead of putting it here, here, and here, they put this row on one line, then this row on a second line, then this row on a third line. You don't have to do that. But most people find it easier to work with when they do it like this. All right. Notice when you use the length field, the length field of the array gives the number of rows in the array. Each row has a length constant that tells how many columns are in that. All right. So there's some operations, summing, et cetera, rows and summing columns of a two-dimensional array. Notice there's no difference between passing a single or two-dimensional array. All right. You still pass it in with the name of the array, but in the routine itself, you'll need two sets, a bracket, if it's a two-dimensional array. Okay, there's the Reagan arrays. So notice what you have there. What you're doing is you're saying, I've got a two-dimensional array, they're calling it Reagan, and it's going to have what? Four rows, how many columns? We're leaving it blank, which means that we can put a different number of columns in each row. Okay, I mean, one of these literally could have been 600 if we wanted to do that. And again, it's set up the exact same way that it's set up in a language like C-sharp. All right. There's a three-dimensional array right there. Okay. Selection sort, as it says, in that case, you find the smallest value and you move it to the front of the array. And I think we've talked about this before. But again, if I've got 10 numbers, uh, uh, let's make it simple, five numbers. 53, 8, 27, 91, and 16. All right, when I get done, 8's going to be here. And I don't care about the rest. But I know what's left is 53, 27, 91, and 16, right? So after I go through this once, the first time through, I have to do this five times. The second time through, I only have to do it four times. Because I already know what the smallest is. So I get done, it's 8, it's 16. Again, I don't care about the rest. But now... I only have to do the next one three times. All right. Depending on how you write it, you're going to either have that be a selection sort or a bubble sort. They're pretty much the same thing. The binary search we've already talked about. When you have and you keep cutting the list in half, with a binary search, it requires that the array be in ascending order to begin with. It must be in ascending order. All right. I'm going to skip the command line arguments. You can read that yourselves if you want to. I have not tried to do anything with command line arguments in Java in IntelliJ IDEA. I haven't tried it, so that's why I'm not going to go over it. All right. The array list class, again, as it says, an array list is similar to an array, but it automatically expands and contracts as needed. That's, again, the thing to realize, as I said to you before, is that when you're using this, as I already told you, it's late binded. So while the program is running, its size can change. You cannot do that with an array you can do that with an array list. Notice that when you use this, that's how you have to say it. So it's the word array list, then inside of angle brackets, you know, a less than and a greater than sign, the type of data that you're using, then the name equals new array list. Now, usually if you, if you leave this blank, in fact, many people leave off those parens. That's an error. See the parens that are in blue there? Most of the time, by default, in most systems, if you leave that blank, it gives it a default size of 16. All right? But you can change it. If I wanted it to be 1,000, I could put 1,000 in there. What that would mean is if I, if I, as soon as I get to 1,000, it's going to add another 1,000 to it. That's just how it works. 
So you populate it like this, the name of the array list dot add, if you want to add things to it, dot size. So notice it's not length here, it's dot size. It says to access the items, you can use get. You can, you can use this stuff within loops. All right, all these different methods that are in here. There's a remove. Typically, you use remove and you put a number in there, and that's what element you want to remove. There's also a set that you can use to replace. Add typically adds them, I believe, to the end automatically. But if you use set, you can tell it what you want to replace with what. Here's what I said to you before. Now, then maybe this has changed, but I know it was 16 at one time. It says an array list has a capacity, which is the number of items it can hold before it automatically doubles its size. It says the default is 10. I was always told it was 16. Okay, I'll, I'll believe what he said. So what this line right here says is I want an array list that's big enough to hold 100 strings. When I attempt to put the 101st string in there, double the size of my list. Give me 100 more locations. Okay? And again, you could put a million in there if you wanted to. All right. You can store any type of object in an array list. So there is an array list of bank accounts. Here is an example of using an array list of bank accounts. So we're adding three new bank accounts, and then we're just printing them out. All right. They call that the diamond operator. I just say that you're using angle brackets. But as it says, beginning in Java 7, you can use, the, use that. All right. And it says there's no need to specify a data type there. Java will do inference. I will tell you that most people still put it in. All right. At least as far as I've seen it. And that's it for the chapter. All right. So we're going to go over some examples. Not right away. We'll take a break first. And then tomorrow we will go into chapter eight. All right. So what I'd like to do, have us do next after we get back from the break is we're going to write an example. We're going to go back to the payroll example that we've been working with. Before we do that, I just want all of you to see this. And like I said, I want you to see this. I sent this to you. Where is it? I sent you two things. And well, I should check and make sure I did send it to you. Well, I sent. Let's. I know I sent you this. And that is, I sent you this Java glossary. Forty-six pages. I got sent this the other day by this guy, Nam Ha Min, and it's got basically everything there is in the language and the definitions of it. All right. Maybe I didn't send the other one to you, and that's, you know, that would be like me to think I sent it to you and then not. So I'm going to try it right now, okay? And what I'm going to send you is this. We'll take a break, and this is what I'm sending you right here. You know, in, in many ways, the Internet is an unbelievably wonderful thing. It really and truly is. Because I thought yesterday, okay, I, wanna, I want us to set up an array. And I want that array to have five elements in it. But what I want to do is every time I run it, I want it to conceivably have a different first name and a different last name in it. So what I did was I Googled and I said, is there any way to give me 25 or 50 random names? And, of course, there's a thing called, like, randomnames.com. And it did it. So that's what I've got. So some of these, you know, Olinda. Uh, Armida, Fredia, etc. They combine different stuff together. But we now have 50 random first names and 50 random last names. All right. You'll see this when we get back, but I will send that to you during the break. So it's 125. Let's take 15. 
and come back, please, at 140.